Women make up nearly 50% of all gamers, yet only a small percentage of women play esports professionally. It's time to figure out how to change that. The Knights want to empower women to build their esports empire. Along with our partner PNC Bank, we are adamant about creating a more equitable future for gamers. There is no one-size-fits-all solution, so we'll be tackling the issue from all angles, featuring insights from a variety of subject matter experts and professionals. I'm Captain Shields Moon with the Knights. Welcome to the Women in Esports Podcast. Hello, and welcome back to the Women in Esports Podcast presented by PNC and the Pittsburgh Knights. I hope you all are having a fantastic summer and have been enjoying the episodes in season three thus far. In case you missed them, uh, season two was with Vernon Maloney. Oh, not season two. Let's roll that back. Episode two. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, Verda Maloney, co-founder of Gamers, about authentic activism. And then we had an excellent panel for our last episode, um, a mix of esports professionals from the Pittsburgh Knights, some folks from PNC, and um, some members from the Chip Ganassi IndyCar team talking about career opportunities in sports and esports. So if you missed that, definitely go back and check it out. Um, before we jump in, some housekeeping. Uh, one, we still want to know what you're interested in learning about, diving into, and professionals that you'd like to speak to. So feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or to the Knights Twitter account or leave a comment in the YouTube uh, video uh, just to tell us what it is that you're thinking, some cool things that you've seen. Um, and without further ado, let's get started with today's show. Oh, I forgot one last thing. Um, in the little bit of time that I have not been here, I have had a kid. So if you hear her in the background, <laughs> she is just very enthusiastic about all the wonderful content that's happening today. So please forgive any coos, cries, or other weird child noises that you might might hear in this in this recording. But um, I am super excited for today's guest. Um, I'm finding in the time that I've been in the gaming industry that esports is kind of a small pond and you, you run into the same people <laughs> or you hear about a person and then it's like, oh, well, here, here's that person. You're always two introductions away from knowing who that person is. And uh, James O'Hagan is a legend. Um, I heard about the Academy of Esports podcast. I've been listening to it for years. And it, to me, it was before its time. Um, it was one of the first podcasts that existed about esports and, and scholastic esports at that, you know, really, really early in the conversation when the, the movement towards education and esports was just beginning to happen. So if you haven't given the Academy of Esports podcast a listen, definitely go over and check it out. You're, you have about four years worth of content to get through, but in the conversation today, I'm sure James will tell you good starting points <laughs> for uh, according to interests. If you haven't heard or listen to the Academy of Esports podcast, definitely pop over and give it a listen. James is also the vice president of education innovation at League Spot. You know, so we'll definitely spend a little bit of time talking about what cool things he's over, up to over there as well. So enough of my blabbing. Let's get into the core content of the show. James, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it, to, especially to be on the Women in Esports podcast and. I am definitely not, I do not identify as, but I, I appreciate that, that you found it worth to have me here. Thank you. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that is a good point. I think the other, the only other person we've had that has not been a woman or identified as a woman is Marcus Howard, who kicked us off in season two, but that's, that's part of it, right? Like, um, figuring out the pipeline solutions, just creating a more um, engaged uh, scene for people of all walks. You know, it takes expert insights from everybody. You know, so we wanted to have the conversation with multiple experts in the field. And it doesn't matter who you are, what you look like, if you have something to offer, and you definitely have a lot of gems to offer. So I'm excited. <laughs> well, I, I will say, though, that as a white male in this space, it is important that we do help and use our privilege and our power to help advocate for those who may not have a, a strong voice as I've learned. And that's been something that I've really learned over the years in this space is just how powerful my voice can be mm -hmm. to help bring attention to or raise something up. And 
it's not always been smooth. Uh, again, I, I make mistakes like anybody else does. Uh, but what I what I have appreciated is having also a close group of colleagues and co and people within the space who have helped to bring me along too. It, it's just because I was early doesn't mean I was right. Uh, just because just because I was doing maybe doing something first doesn't mean I was doing it the right way. Um, these voices that that I have talked with and worked with over the years, like I said, have also been my support network as well to help educate me and bring me to uh, where I am. And part of the podcast is that as well too, the Academy of Esports. It's meeting people across the space and finding out who, having a conversation and finding out who they are. Mm -hmm. I love it. And um, thank you so much for saying that because it is important and it's one thing not to do it. It's another thing to speak out against it. And you know, so we appreciate any and everybody who has the courage to do that. Cause it, I mean, it's not an easy thing to do, you know, mm -hmm. but it is so important in growing the scene and making it more reflective of what the gaming fabric actually looks like, you know, Correct. which is incredibly and wonderfully diverse. So my favorite question, because no two answers are ever, ever the same. And it just blows my mind, like how, how it, people get into the industry. So Everybody who's watched the show knows this is my always my first question. What got you into the gaming industry? <laughs> well, see, that's the thing is I don't see myself as as I mean now working for League Spot, yes, definitely part of the gaming industry. But I I grew up as a child of the eighties. I was born in nineteen seventy five, so right around when I was five years old, just tall enough to get to the uh, to to be able to pull the joystick and ask for a quarter. Video games were popping up everywhere. I mean, go to a grocery store, there were video games at the back of the grocery store. You would go to a pizza place, they would be all over the place. It, it, arcades themselves, if you've watched Stranger Things, I like to tell my children, Stranger Things is real. Oh, like, yeah. like, there is so much, like riding bikes and going out all day and not calling home. Oh yeah, we did that all the time. And it, there was never a, a fear or a worry or anything like that. We just went out. I think people say like kids of the eighties are like the toughest kids ever. Cause they were like, basically we were handed the keys to the house at like five years old and just like told to go off and go wander the neighborhood and go through people's backyards and go into strange people's homes. It was just a very different time. But what got me into the, to the industry itself was, I guess part of that was the upbringing, but also my background as an educator. Um, I am one who, kind of grew up with a Montessori, if you will say, blend of education where a lot of experimentation and hands-on and finding what my passions were, not necessarily being a kid who sat well in the class. I mean, I could play school really well with the best of them. I was not a rule breaker by any means in school, but uh, I always loved play. And I just see, always saw video games as an extension of that play. And when I first started teaching in 1999, so it sounds like to me, I say that and it just sounds like yesterday and it feels like yesterday. But in that time, um, we started a gaming club right away and we called it a computer club at first, but really it became a gaming club and it was bringing in the game Starcraft. And that was our big, and this, these were not high school kids. These were middle school kids. And it wasn't just what I found interesting. Wasn't just that it was boys coming into the room it was also girls and not necessarily girls who were just wanting to play but they just wanted to hang out and have a space i mean we did get some girls playing don't get me wrong but it was about setting up a space and a place for them to come and feel welcome and again have teaching experiences and learning experiences through play uh, i used to do a a, a, a classroom-based economy when i had a self-contained fifth grade classroom which by the way self-contained if you're if you're going to be a new teacher and you're just starting this year and you're in elementary and you have a self-contained class, you get to build a family. It's like the greatest thing ever. But what I will say is that in that classroom, for example, I, I still have it on my computer, my desktop right here, SimCity 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we use that as a teaching tool in the classroom to talk about not just our economy in the classroom, which we use paper and we didn't have a whole, it was a lot of, of offline, but the online stuff about talking about managing a city and and how budgets work and how taxes work and taxing industry and and everybody kind of having a say in a role kind of almost running it like a city council thing mm -hmm. it was it was uh bringing in those kind of games and experiences that i always felt were things that a lot of teachers kind of looked down upon or if it wasn't a game that was quote unquote educational so like the 
um, you know, Math Blasters. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, <laughs> probably, probably, actually, one of the games that I think was meant to be super educational, but kids kind of made it their own thing was uh, Oregon Trail. That oh, was one absolutely. that I, I grew up with Oregon Trail on the mm-hmm. green Apple IIe's, you know, green screen, and it was like I just need four oxen and all the bullets. Just that's all I need. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna just you're, rough you're this. Not gonna... I'm gonna rough this a, no, no. First of all, how, how, like so many people get it. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> but seriously, that was one of those games where we took the educational out of it. It was like we're just gonna do deer hunting and we're gonna just like we're gonna. What I don't understand. What's cock a wagon mean? I don't know. But <laughs> we found out because we were interested in the game. It, right. it was it was experiences like that in my childhood. Uh, my mother was a computer teacher as well, and she would bring home. Um, she worked at a very affluent school where a lot of Apple executives had their families. So guess what? They got all the brand new mm-hmm. Macintosh computers when those came out. And w- one of the games that I, two games I remember most clearly, Revolution 76 and SimCity were two games in my late elementary, early middle school years that really were things that kind of showed me the value of of play. But but ga- putting it in a sense that made that that to me, I carried forward into my educational career as well. Uh, and it isn't just, and I know this is a really long answer for the question that you asked, but no, you said we're going to go down rabbit holes. You you really opened up one with the first question. <laughs> this will be a four hour episode, everybody. We're we're going Joe Rogan style here. We're going to be like <laughs> four or five hours in. People will be listening. But look, <laughs> it it really truly was something that. Um, as being a teacher and seeing the value, the intrinsic value of these games for kids, and not just in esports, but I'm talking like in gaming in general, whether it's mm-hmm. offline or online games, um, there is intrinsic value in those things to motivate children and help them get on the right path. Um, sometimes with education, if done properly, that doesn't mean just, hey, we're going to play a whole bunch of video games and mm-hmm. just let you go crazy. But having purpose and meaning and real thought behind everything that you do with it. Um, we still are in a day and an age when a lot of people don't understand the value of video games as educational tools, including mm-hmm. some companies. I was glad to see that Riot uh, changed their community guidelines that allowed educators and schools and nonprofits to, again, start utilizing their titles and ways to run tournaments and things. But now we have Blizzard saying no to those things. So. It, it's been a, it's been a career of getting to this point of getting into where I am now with League Spot, of of sorting through advocacy and really looking at at the impact that these games can make or break some children. The access to these things can make or break the educational experiences for some children. I, I'm proud to say even that a couple of weeks ago, actually it was last Saturday, um, or excuse me, last Friday, I had a student who was in our esports club for several years. Mm-hmm. And I had been working with him to graduate. And I don't think if I didn't have that connection to him through our gaming club that he would have finished and graduated. He, he graduated already a year late, but he did finish. Okay. And, it was, and, it was, and it was something that he got to text me and we were texting back and forth. And, and, but our, our connection wasn't through school. Our connection started with games and gameplay. Mm-hmm. So that's a really long answer to a, long, to a that- big question. <laughs> That was a fantastic answer to a very important question because, I mean, you know, I think a lot of people there like there's a misconception that there's some straight arrow path into the industry or that you have to go into like programming or a support role or something in the industry in order to grow and flourish. And one of the things that I'm most excited about and tell a lot of people that I talk to is that you're skills and your talents, your passions and interest areas outside of gaming can feed into working in the, in the industry, you know, and sometimes it it allows you to explore different things or or come to conclusions that might not have been considered um, at all, or to the extent that they have been considered. If, you know, somebody like you, who's an educator, wasn't looking at gaming through the lens of education and like, no, 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 no. Like, I know that this touched me. I know that it can touch other people. So let's dig deep into that. Um, Mm -hmm. I get so excited seeing all of the new curricula that's out around, you know, well, gaming augmenting like learning curriculums, you know, so, and there's so many great titles to do it, but I mean, we could talk about that for like eight years. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, well, even now, you brought up a title that a lot of people don't think of educationally, but something that spurred a lot of previous um, intrinsically motivating topics that I studied as a child, the game Hades. First of all, that game is just fun. I love the game Hades, the music, everything. It was one of my favorite podcast interviews to do. I know we we're going to talk about that later, but I had to bring that one up real quick. Yeah. Um, because because I had a I had a huge passion for Greek mythology when I was in fifth, sixth, seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And as soon as somebody said, oh, here's a video game that's got mythology. And I'm like, oh, I'm oh. in. <laughs> and it's like the artwork and the multiculturalism and the, you know, gender fluidity that the greeks were famous for and things like but <laughs> but bringing it all together in a game it was like oh if i had this game in when i was fifth fifth sixth seventh grade i probably would have put 90 hours in easy you know mm. as a child i've put in over 100 on this one but according to steam at least <laughs> <laughs> no that is that's a fantastic example i mean hades deserves every award it received like Ooh, you talk about a phenomenal experience. Let's talk about the Academy of Esports podcast real quick. Yeah. It's been running for over four years. Like, what led your heart to start it? Um, my partner sat me down and, and sometimes in a nice way saying like, oh, you really should do this. And then it became like a, you need to do this. <laughs> and I'm really glad that I did. And, it, and, and to the, and you're, you know, all of us doing these podcasts, you know, we, we start and you, unless you've done a podcast before, you really don't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. um, mine look, my first episode looked like a hostage video. I, I think I had the, I had the camera way too close to my face. I was, <laughs> and, and I'm a kid who, I was a kid who was in middle school, high school plays. I was in the marching band in college. So I'm used to being on, you know, you put me in front of a hundred thousand people. Eh, it's no big deal. I don't, I don't yeah. care. But for some reason, I turned on that camera and it was like in my head, I'm thinking this has to be perfect. This has to be perfect. This has to be perfect. And it it never is. And mm -hmm. it, it's a matter of just putting yourself out there, uh, sharing your ideas, sharing your thoughts. And uh, yeah, I've got four years of content of, in, of conversations I feel that are still relevant, but still some that I come back to. Mm -hmm. uh, it, even um, this weekend, I, I met up with Devin Jack uh, who heads up the uh, competi uh, Comp MC, which is Competition Minecraft Group. They all met playing Minecraft together. Then they, they, they formed a, a company to create what they called Steal the Wool, which was a game that they developed for Minecraft. And then this weekend, they've got their own, they've got their own convention now. And, oh, these are, and most of those people, and most of those kids, I call them kids because they still can't drink. You know, it, it's, they, they were, it was so fun to see and go back and think, I said to Devin, I said, man, I just listened to that interview and you just sound like such a, a high school baby, you know, and it's like, and now you're running your own convention. And I said, we've got to go back and we got to have another episode. Yeah. And I haven't been, uh, one of the things I think it's been a biggest struggle and this is, it goes probably for all content creators is finding things that motivate you or conversations that you want to have. And I was really struggling when I first started the podcast to really, because it was still so new and still trying to figure things out. I didn't know who to have conversations with, but I've definitely become a lot more selective in who I have conversations with, but it, it doesn't mean I'm putting out an episode every week anymore. But again, what I do, when I, hopefully when I do put something out that it, that it matters and it makes a difference, I don't just want to say, Hey, here's the 30 minutes where we sit around and talk about the uh, topics of the week. That's not what this podcast is for. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. And that's great advice. Um, the work has to resonate with you. You know, it doesn't mean that it's going to be fun all the time, but it has to matter at some level. Otherwise, right. what's the point? All right. So what Hades, the episode with Hades, I haven't heard that one yet. I'm going to go back and give that a listen while I'm Darren Kolb. It's a it, and he did he did all the music and he did the voice of Zagreus. And I did not ask him to do the voice. I did not. <laughs> but you talk about those different pathways, you know, in the first question that you asked. Yeah. Uh, Darren actually grew up not far from where I grew up. He was years younger than me, but he actually went to a high school that all my uncles went to, uh, Bellarmine High School down near San Jose, California, and didn't have a, is a musician, but doesn't have like a, a professional background, you could say, in music. Mm -hmm. uh, more, it was something else that he did on the side, but he has parlayed that into creating I think one of the best between Cuphead and Hades, these are two of some of the best 
gaming soundtrack ever made. Oh, yeah. And um, again, as you said, his was a very non-conventional way to get into the gaming industry, and it was just through playing in his band. I mean, that's that's how he found his way into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's that's really cool. Um, and so Hades episode. What is another memorable episode? One that's just like, ah, oh, man, that was. Okay. Last, I don't know, something. <laughs> well, there's a lot. There, honestly, there's a lot of there's a lot of memories for everyone. One that that to me just like absolutely just tugged on my childhood heartstrings, just because of how much his voice is recognizable to me was the interview with Tim Kitzrow. If you've played NBA Jam or if you've played NFL Blitz, uh-huh. uh, he is the voice. You know, boom shakalaka. He's the you know. <laughs> Roadway downtown, you know, and now I saw Tim at a, at, we only did it over uh, Zoom because of the pandemic uh, when we did our interview and he did a, he did a promo cut for me and I now run that at the front of my podcast. It's fantastic. I love it. That's awesome. But I saw him at a conference in Milwaukee and it, it's like, he comes up and talks to me like he's, and he is, he's one of the most normal guys. He lives down in Chicago. Uh, his roommate actually was um, uh, one of my favorite actors, Stanley Tucci. Uh, in college, I'm like, how did, how do you, you know, you were in Second City and you know doing all these things, and here's this guy who goes off and does movies with, you know, uh, you know, big movies, and here you are doing, you know, voiceover work for uh, NBA Jam. But uh, Tim, Tim was a great get. Darren Kolb was fantastic. But even um, when I got to talk with, I, I say kids, one of my favorite interviews, and I'm pulling it up right here because I just want to make sure I have the uh, George Walker. George Walker is a student in Milwaukee, and George and his father got together and started the esports program at a school up in at a high school up in Milwaukee. Um, and it, he's 14 years old, and and just talking about what he had to go through to get his esports team started at, at his school. And then the other thing that I've done too with some of these conversations is it's given me the opportunity to experiment a little bit. So, for example. Um, I helped head up a uh, Games Make a Difference symposium at Purdue University on April 8th and 9th. Uh, Mr. Chris Bishop and I, we worked together to get the the pool together of people to speak at it. And then I said, you know, Chris, the problem with conferences is a lot of times, especially if you have everybody on panels, is they don't necessarily get to share their voice very well. Sometimes they get, you know, overrun by somebody else or a topic kind of takes them out of the the loop. We we dedicated... um, Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different podcast episodes just for people who are going to be on those panels to make sure that we gave them at least at least around 30 minutes of time just to have some one on one. So it extended the conversation of the the symposium. It extends the conversation to, hey, I really liked hearing about that person. Oh, I can go to the podcast now and find out a little bit more about them. Or before you come to the conference or you come to the symposium, you, you check it out. And now you know who you're going to go see and who you're getting into possibly what the discussion is going to kind of go towards. And it helped me as an MC because then I found out, hey, I can load up some of these questions or some of these questions may need to be uh, adjusted. Or maybe we don't ask them because, mm-hmm. you know, in the podcast interview, they didn't necessarily, you know, engage in that in that question. No, that's fantastic. That's actually brilliant. I love that. Um that's Everybody really cool. can steal that idea. And I wish more people would steal that idea. Yeah, because that is a great point about the panels. It's just like, oh, well, I'm just going to be quiet now because we're two steps removed from what I'm comfortable with speaking about. So that's great. Yeah, everybody that's listening, you should totally steal that for your next conference or convention. That's that's a great idea. <laughs> I'm stealing that. <laughs> Go for it. Please. Ah, all right. And then I, may I... There are so many new cool job titles, right? Like... I don't, I probably like two times a day. I'm like, oh, I wish that major existed when I was going through school or what, what does that even mean? But it sounds awesome. And like hearing that you're the vice president of education innovation, that is definitely a title I'm jealous of. Like, (laughs) I think it's amazing. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you do there at League Spot? Well, it was one of these things where I know there's a lot of educators who are coming out of teaching now and entering the, I guess you could say the private sector. Um, and it, 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 for some, it is a very scary transition. Um, for me, I wasn't, I was, I was either given a choice of backing off of esports and backing off the library services that I love 
and focusing on purely being a principal at the virtual school that I was working at and not having those other things that I really love that keeps me a part of the job. Or I could have gone and been a hall monitor. I don't know. Um, they would have owed me money anyway. It was a two-year contract. <laughs> but yeah, I would have been the highest paid hall monitor in the city you've ever seen. No, but but when when given that option and I said, no, I, I these are the things I really love. I want to make sure that I'm still a part of them. Um, I did go off and found uh, through through again using the podcast for years as a way to develop my network, to share my ideas and share my thoughts with other people, and being on it early enough. Again, thank you to my partner for uh, for, for pushing me and getting me really out of my comfort zone to do it. Um, this switch to the private sector was not something that I took uh, willy nilly. It was something that again took a lot of of thought and effort and networking. Um, when I came out, I, it was not that there was this job VP of education innovation. Um, there were a few people who I reached out to directly to say, you know what, I, I, I decided I really have to just do this now full time. This is where my heart is. This is where my passion is. And uh, Vi uh, League Spot was one of two companies that I really, um, have admired from afar in how they ran things, especially when it comes to things like data privacy, when it comes to things like telling the story and, and, and having, um, I guess you could say treating, treating people in the space educators the right way and doing it with, with, with good intentions that it was an opportunity to, to write my own job. And again, it, it's, it's, because of the work, I, I didn't just fall into this. You know, you just said, James, you have four years of podcast. Yeah. It, this isn't just something that I just started doing yesterday and, you know, going back to Rockford in 2014 and starting to put this together there and Kurt Melcher doing what he was doing at Robert Morris. You know, you got to, I have to thank Kurt because if it wasn't for Kurt, the one conversation that happened in the hallway at that moment, and I can remember that time too, would never have happened. I wouldn't be sitting here at home today, just enjoy wearing shorts and not stressed out in the middle of August. Like I normally would be right now. Um, the, the position though, is really looking at challenging clients to really think about their use of games and gameplay. Are you using it to the fullest extent? Now, a lot of our clients are YMCA's, but there are other clients, non endemic clients that we were working with where I'm involved in the conversation as well, too, to say, have you really to, for me to challenge them to think about how they can really engage their workforce, because this isn't just about video games. This is still comes back to a lot of what I, my dissertation work was based around, which is self-determination theory. And I'm not a doctor yet. Don't start calling me doctor. But self-determination theory is a huge component of getting people motivated to do things. And how do you do that? And a lot of people think esports, you know, in schools is just the magic way to do it. And that's not it at all. It wasn't, it was never about the games. The games were a tool for us to engage kids, just like how games can be a tool to engage your, your non-endemic workforce in the gaming space, or how we can, uh, again, bring, bring your business or your idea uh, to other people without it having to necessarily even be competitive. It, it, you know, esports by itself is competitive, but I think a lot of people need to just start talking too about just games and gameplay in general. Thank you so much, uh, James, for sharing what you've been up to at League Spot and and how you you got there. You know, I mm -hmm. think it's important. I mean, this seems to be a, a constant in our conversation, but I think it's important for people to realize, especially those that aren't in the industry or are looking to make their way in. It's like you you never know when that next conversation that that next oh I wonder how cool it would be to do this or just how you can make a path for yourself in the industry that aligns with everything that you're interested in um, and, and have a passion for. And goodness knows there's so many opportunities in esports outside of the, the pro player scene. And that's I'm the been worst. I'm the worst game. <laughs> Me too. I will. I'm awful. <laughs> I'll find a way to stand in a corner and like shoot myself for like 10 minutes. Like I'm terrible at anything. Like, it's just bad. So pro playing was not for me at all. But, you know, there's there's such a wealth of experiences and a need, you know, for new perspectives in the industry. So thank you for, for sharing. Um, 
Yeah, um, the, real, real quick, one of the yeah. things I found when I started at League Spot, they're like, oh, we play a lot of League of Legends. I'm like, are you good? No, I'm not. <laughs> yes. no, I'm not good at all. Me like, either. My, my own children, when we would play Overwatch together, they'd be like, Dad, can you drop out? Because you're making this <laughs> Oh, no. What? <laughs> we would rather go down a person than have you just keep constantly getting us, like, run in. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, no, I, I was playing horrible to say the tutorial and smite you know and i'm working at high risk studios and i'm like oh yeah this is and i'm just like whoa whoa this is so much I, <laughs> i'm drowning here what's going on they're like cat you literally are still in the tutorial <laughs> so, <laughs> so yes pro scene is not for everybody but there's still plenty to do yes and you know this uh being an advocate is so important um you know they're you mentioned it earlier, there's just still a lot of misconceptions around what gaming is, you know, what it can do and kind of opportunities it can afford people and especially in the education space. Um, you know, so educating the public and inspiring students is a large part of what we do. We not only are we talking about what we know and what we've brought to the table, but we're making it make sense for other people. So um, being that you were, you know, in my opinion, a pioneer when it comes to Scholastic Esports. Did you get any, like, what kind of pushback did you get? Like, was there any, what kind of obstacles did you have to overcome? I think the biggest part that people need to think about when they're talking about Scholastic is that you have, first of all, you've got to, you've got to be on your game. Mm -hmm. you're, you're talking about working with people's kids. And in the Scholastic, when you're talking about K-12, now collegiate, I... I have experience working in collegiate. I've advocated for collegiate. I brought voices, you know, out on the podcast at the collegiate scene. Dr. Chris Haskell has done a series of great interviews uh, for the podcast from Boise State. And those are fun if you listen to those over the years as well, because he, you can kind of hear his journey in that. But when you're talking about working with kids, minors, tr there's a huge trust issue, right? As teachers, we, you send us your kids as you're holding your little one right now, you you send us your kids for six to eight hours a day, yeah, and, and hope that they come home better, not worse off than when they walked out the door, right? And so I think it's I think there were too many people, especially early on, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pick on anybody because like, there was a lot of people who are st who were stepping into education, not realizing, thinking they were getting into the billion dollar esports industry at the time. And instead, they were stepping into the one point four trillion dollar education industry, oh. where we we have we have rules and ways of doing things that that aren't necessarily people who who just want kids to play video games. Yeah, give them the opportunity, whether they are for profit or not for profit, but just give them that experience to play games. And and we had to educate a lot of people, like, Ooh, there are rules. You know, you can't just do this or do that. You can't just you know, cold call a teacher in the middle of the day and expect for them to turn around, you know, $12,000, $15,000, or whatever, you know, PO by the end of next week. That's not how this works. So in, in the scholastic space, there was a lot of that. There was also a lot of working with teachers because there's a lot of teachers who love to game, but we've always been kind of put in the back shadows. Uh, we, you know, gaming was not something that was ever really embraced. Um, by by the K twelve system until really recently, mm. um, and again that goes back to a lot of the negative stereotypes about gamers that we've helped to try to dispel uh, using the five pillars that we use as our as our guide for the Racine Unified Esports Program, and and that I share for a lot of people and say take these and use these. This, to me, I think these are universal truths that when we talk about that when we're looking at what esports should mean for scholastic spaces that we are talking about something that is transformational, that we have this opportunity yet. When I, when I tell people the, the research that Pew did a few years ago, looking at how many teenagers are playing video games, mm -hmm. and they were saying 97% of boys and 83% of girls were playing video games. Those are numbers like we never see in anything. You never see 97% of 83, 83% of girls, 97% uh, of boys, 83% of girls playing basketball. Yet we have basketball tournaments that go on for, you know, playing football, mm -hmm. doing musicals, doing plays in, in theater, uh, in science. 
And what's interesting is of all those things I just said, we never even tell those kids that they spend too much time doing those things or what they are doing in those things is a waste of time. Now imagine, again, we have the stereotypes of gamers, you know, the, and I always ask people this at my, whenever I would speak, I say, describe to me a gamer. And it was always, it was either basement or bedroom. Uh Uh, It was either too fat or too skinny. It was boy. It was very, never, never did anybody ever say girl. It was always a boy. Mm-hmm. Usually a white male, and, and that and that was also concerning. And that their diet was Mountain Dew, pizza, and <laughs> yeah. Red Bull. Okay. Yep. <laughs> and so, of course, schools are going to go, why would we want any of that? But again, it's because we as the adults have mm-hmm. said to these kids, what you're doing is a waste of time. Imagine your parents telling you what you're doing is a waste of time. Or that thing that you really love to do, your friends tell you is a waste of time. That's going to impact you negatively. I could think of many times where I was doing something just because I liked doing it and being told, why are you doing that? And having to like second guess myself. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I wasn't about to do that. So uh, we have a very powerful teaching opportunity here. We want to make sure that in the scholastic space, that it isn't just about playing. games. Oh, that sounded like a good one. (laughs) (laughs) My goodness. I'm sorry. (laughs) No, you're good. But we, we've got some we've got some really good um, opportunities here to engage with kids. And sometimes you only got one shot because of the negative stereotypes that are there. You don't want that bad thing happening on your watch. So you've got to do your homework. You've got to be prepared for those parent questions. You've got to be prepared for those questions from your school board. And you got to make sure that your esports program is speaking to the strategic goals of whatever your institution is that you're working at, because when you're in a de- budget deficit, if it's not making a uh, the needle move on the academics, it's one of the first things that gets cut. You're, James, you raised an interesting point, and I think it's an important one where you mentioned that you know having an esports team in and of itself is just it's just one thing you know now when it comes to to esports in schools, and that it shouldn't even really be. Though important, it shouldn't be the sole focus. I know there was this huge rush where it seemed like every school in college was like, oh, we have our own esports team. Mm -hmm. But, you know, really, I think now, and there's probably some fancy term for it in the business world, but I'm just going to call it like you're figuring it out. (laughs) Where it's like, we called it rushed implementation. There we go. That's exactly what it was. It's It's good that it's there, but it's like, is the effectiveness there? Is the stickiness there? Is it really making the impact that is needed um, in the space? And I'm really glad to hear that there's a lot of different schools and orgs that are taking a different approach when it comes to implementing esports and or gaming um, in their programming. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate about appreciate about you and your work is that you've spent time, you know, Maybe there was a rush to implementation moment, but you're definitely beyond that now. And you're in the you're in the 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 finer points of methodologies and systems and what works and what doesn't. Um, it's not enough just to have like, oh, look at our esports team, it's awesome. You know, there there's a lot more to it than that. And on your website, and you mentioned it earlier, is the the five pillars um, that you decided are necessary to have um, make the most of scholastic esports. I know what they are, but I'd love it if you could share them with our audience and then, um, you know, just talk about um, different ways that organizations can apply this to their, their operations. If there's sure. a secret sauce or something in there. <laughs> well, when, when I understand and, and you're right, when, when we started the program in Rockford, Illinois at Rockford public schools and at Guilford high school in early 2015, now we started planning in 14, but the, it really was a rush. It was, Hey, we've got this money and this thing is starting in April. Can we, can we do it? And I'm like, yes, I was the director of instructional tech at the time. And it was literally like, get the computers, get them in the kids' hands, get them configured. And when you go and look at the photos from that day that I have, it's all boys in the room, uh, about 10 of them. And these were the kids who, you put the flyer up in the hallway that said, you know, eSports, come come try it out. And again, we're talking 2015, where eSports was not a common part of our language. No. It was it was funny. Uh, I used to give presentations at education conferences 
and around that time, 15, 16, and it would be me and two other people in the room. And one of them would be there thinking that I was talking about something for Spanish language. And then they would leave because they thought e a sports, you know? Oh my <laughs> goodness. Yes. Yeah. Wow. They yeah. thought I was doing like Spanish PE. So oh no, yeah. <laughs> so they would leave, um, you know, and then fast forward years later and, and, and a lot of people would just, I remember there was an FETC conference, which used to stand for Florida education technology and anybody who put in an esports thing was like packed rooms. Okay. Um, but as we fast forward again, we have to think philosophically around this because again, where I'm coming from in the Mercine Unified School District, we were looking at tens of millions of dollars of budget deficits year after year. Now, how do you build something? How do you grow something when you're facing declining enrollments and you're facing uh, declining budget situations? And so it was really necessary for me to make sure that as I was developing the program to include the research, the, the thought process behind it, be able to speak to board members about it in a language that they understand to the community members, to our stakeholders in languages that they understand and the parents as well too. And to the other teachers in the school. I mean, I'll give you, I'll give you an example in a second here of, of just how even talking about esports and wanting it to be this thing is more than just playing video games was even just difficult because first off, we wanted to redefine athletic culture. That's the first pillar. Okay. So by redefining athletic culture, we're talking about less misogyny. We're talking about, you know, teams that don't care about gender. You know, you could mm -hmm. be gender whomever, as long as you're a human being and you're in a specific <laughs> age range, we want you to be a part of this. Okay. Mm -hmm. You are invited. And that was a very early conversation to have. Ah! Um, yes, <laughs> it was <laughs> because we needed to make sure that this again, wasn't just something for boys because the data and the research says that it shouldn't be. Um, I came from a background of playing football in high school and I hated every second of it. My dad played at Notre Dame. My grandfather played for the New York Giants. It was kind of like an expected thing. I really hated football. I ended up playing rugby in college, but that was, that's, a, everybody's like, oh, they look so similar. No, I totally do. But anyway. And you just, did you just recently retire from rugby? Did I see that somewhere? I'm still, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I went down out in the garage and I saw the cleats and I'm like, you know, I might be able to just, yeah, coming up on 47. I can, still, I can still throw those 18 year olds around, but anyway, <laughs> but, but that goes into the next thing, which is diversifying opportunities for student participation, which means we want to make sure that our teams are a representation of our cross section of our schools. So if the school is 30% white, 30% Hispanic and 40% African American, our team should be that if it's 50, 50 male and female, we want it to be 50, 50 male and female on our mm -hmm. teams as well. Now, do we get there out the gate? Absolutely not. That's not necessarily how, what, unfortunately with this, that isn't always what happens, but it is a goal that we want to be working for. And that defines the work and the way that we are communicating with people and that we are approaching people. Um, finding kids who, um, who need this the most are probably gonna be the ones who social workers know really well for a variety of different reasons, okay? We wanna find those kids who are not engaged and other things because we know when we get them involved in extracurriculars, GPA goes up and attendance increases, which means then graduation rates increase. But the other big thing around this too is we wanted to promote good mental and physical health. That's our third pillar. Um, the physical health components, people would look at me strangely and go, well, how the heck do you promote good physical health through esports? But really when you start to look at the brain science, the neuroscience uh, around what exercise does for your brain, for example, weightlifting helps with the prefrontal cortex development of your brain, this part right here, which happens to help with problem solving. Well, guess what? When you are in video games, you are constantly problem solving. Weightlifting actually has a benefit of helping you problem solve while you lift weights. It helps to develop, again, the neural pathways that are going to allow you to be a better problem solver. Or if you're doing yoga or any kind of cardiovascular training where you are working your heart. And understand too for a lot of these kids they were coming from situations where they were avoiding exercise like the play and it is because they were not intrinsically motivated to want to be a part of of exercise or maybe it was something that was introduced to them in a way that made them feel you know dumb or out of culture or or whatever it is 
the, the intrinsic motivating value of video games and starting to introduce now the conversations of, hey, drink more water. Hey, start exercising. Hey, get your sleep. Hey, eat right. Now, the sleep conversation is probably the one I failed the most with. So don't feel like, J hey, James done this all perfectly. No, no, no. The sleep one is definitely the hardest conversations. I've, that, that's the one that 16, 17, 18 year olds have laughed at me in the face. They're like, there's no way that I can do my school day and get eight hours of sleep and do all the homework and do, I mean, anyway. But the mental health component of this too is really important, especially in the community in which I live. Racine County has a, a district that is about the size of um, 18,000 kids. And it is, it is a huge, um, it is a, uh, there's a huge problem with mental health, uh, adverse childhood experiences. At least 60% of adults in Racine County have had at least one adverse childhood experience. There could be homelessness, abuse, divorce, you know, hunger, whatever it may be. That means that those are probably getting passed down. We know that those are generational. Those can get passed down from, from adults to kids. Mm -hmm. So when kids are coming to us in a mental health crisis, when the school day is the one day that they have to feel safe, or get a meal or feel loved. Uh, they're coming in with a lot of, of trauma right out the gate. Having a positive adult interaction and play are the two ways that we can push against the mental health crisis. And that's what esports allows us to have a positive wow. adult interaction because they love the games that you love and the opportunity to play. And play is really the last pillar. We have to honor the importance of play. We've done a horrible job of honoring the importance of play in this country. Uh, we have become so hyper focused on what's productive. Mm -hmm. Well, play, play is productive too. And as Mr. Rogers like to basically say, work the the play is the work of childhood. It's what makes childhood what it is supposed to be. So by playing, we are helping these kids develop the neural pathways. We are helping them develop the soft skills that we talk so much about that haven't been happening. But also, we are engaging them in things that are going to interest them and carry them forward into their lives. Oh, that's. That's I hadn't I hadn't considered play through that lens, you know, like it's it's people think it's just some trivial thing where you're like, oh, look, I drew a unicorn out of a mud or something, you know, and it's 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 frivolous and it's something that children do. But you're you're absolutely right. The um, play play matters a lot more than. than we as adults probably recognize, you know, and and. That is a big, and that's a big part of of gaming. It's it, you're playing a game, you know. So for the fact that it's just the medium's different. Yeah. It's just in in this case we're doing huh. digital and not physical. Right. So. I don't know. Have has anybody written like a thesis or a dissertation around some of the concepts that you've presented so far? Because I, if not, I see it coming. <laughs> like, there's so you, many intersections, well, right? Self, <laughs> surf, self, surf, self determination theory is what I, what again focused on, and that is around the the values of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, basically. Okay. Ways that you are intrinsically motivated to do things is you have a sense of autonomy, meaning you can do them, you do them whether you want to without being told to do them, you, you just do them, right? I played Stardew Valley last night for eight hours because I wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, I felt a sense of competency doing it. I didn't feel like a complete idiot. I, I, <laughs> there's a game I recently played, Risk of Rain 2, that I played for about oh, five minutes. Game. Yeah, I know, but I played it for like five minutes and I'm like, I am an idiot with this game. I gotta go back to the drawing board. I'm not gonna touch this one for a little bit. Mm -hmm. But then you also want your sense of community. Okay, you want to feel that sense of togetherness, that sense of belonging. When you put those three things together, autonomy, uh, competency, and this community, that what is what intrinsically motivates people to do things. And again, that's what we're getting back to in all of this is how can we use these things that kids will do without being told to do them? They will get up on a Saturday morning. They will, they will research. They will watch YouTube videos. They will do all these things without ever um, setting foot, you know, being told to do it. We got to, we got to find a way to, to harness that energy because everybody can say, oh, these kids are so lazy. They, all they do is just watch YouTube and they just consume, consume, consume. Well, there's a lot of that, but that's, but again, I'm not saying that this will fix all of that. This is not the silver bullet. This is a solution, not the solution. Whenever we talk about something like this. No, I love it. That's great. Um, so I want to, 
go back to two of the pillars that you talked about in particular and like talk about it through the lens of women in these sports because I think that there's some connection points. So redefining athletic culture and then divi- diversifying opportunities for student participation. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to building a better pipeline or an inclusive um, area for women or even minorities, you know, to enter the esports field when it comes to scholastic um, scholastic opportunities. How can those two pillars guide um, leadership? You know, who do a better job? Well, that was a again, very convoluted question. I can ask but it I better think, if you like. But I, but I think I but I think I got it in the sense okay. that. Again, you need to you need to have a plan or idea of what you want your teams to look like. Don't try to figure out what the culture is going to be after you start it, because that's the culture. You have to know what you want. If your culture is going to be, we're putting the flyer up and we're going to have the teams and whoever shows up, shows up, and that's all I can do, well, then that's your culture. You, you get the kids who show up. But if your culture is, I'm working with a social worker, the social worker is a coach they, they, you know, on our team. As an example, and uh, we're not just going to have male voices in here. We're going to have female voices in leadership roles as well, which is something that we really worked hard to have as well in the Racine um, School District. Um, it, it's it's one of those things that you have to think about, again, where you're not rushing to implement, when you're not like, hey, let's get this planned at the beginning of August and have it ready to go September 1st. But like, you know, I'm talking like a half a school year of really laying it out and saying and planning it out that's that's when you um, start to see the successes and you start to make things be um, a little more meaningful. Um, I get that kids will come to you and say, oh, we really want to do this. And they're very excited and they just they just want to get going as fast as possible. But really, and unfortunately, we need to to walk before we run. And so uh, a lot of people seem to forget that as well. So we hear about esports a lot at the collegiate level, but mm-hmm. with your focus being K through 12, like you have to get started early. That's that's the stance that I've always kind of taken. It's like by the time you get to college, if you're just introducing somebody to gaming and esports as a learning mechanism or even like a fun thing to do if they haven't been doing it at some capacity, that cell is a lot harder than if it's been there in kindergarten. And if you're playing math blasters, which, by the way, did not help my math skills whatsoever. Whatsoever, <laughs> love the game, but math is definitely still a very difficult uh, undertaking for me. Um, you know, it's so important to have like those those stops along the way as a child grows and develops. You know, so that it doesn't. It's not this big rush of like oh, here's a brand new thing and it's totally valuable and you should totally spend a lot of time doing it. But if it's there all along and it's encouraged, then that's a very different experience. So when it comes to building scholastic experiences that are focused around gaming, Mm -hmm. um, what do schools or those leading um, um, organizations uh, need to consider when it comes to making women or young girls rather comfortable, you know, in the space? Like, are there best practices? Are is there research out there that shows what works and what doesn't? would love your insight. For me, I, I don't have any scientific research other than to say the kids need to see themselves, mm-hmm. right? In, in the people who are leading them. And, and so again, if you're working, and again, I realize that there's very limited uh, resources for some districts and some people are just so frightened stepping into the space because again, they, they don't, one thing teachers don't like to be is not the expert in the room. Mm. Uh, they're used to being the content experts. In this case is a lot of teachers are not content experts. They are coming in as the ones who need to be led. As I lovingly called some of our esports, we called them general managers. I didn't even call them coaches. And specifically we called them general managers because general manager is really good at organizing, really good about getting people around the room, really good about making sure things are are set up right. A coach is somebody who's like, okay, we're going to do this, 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 and this. But if you don't have the capacity to do those things, you're kind of stuck. Mm-hmm. So general manager is what we called our people. And I, and I made sure to the, the example that I used for a lot of them to make them comfortable. And after they started watching the show, they were like, oh, he wasn't putting me down. <laughs> I started calling him Ted Lasso's. Like you are, you are one of our... <laughs> You are one of our Ted Lassos, 
Okay, mm -hmm. you are you don't know the game, mm -hmm. but you are a master at getting these kids or these people to do things that they didn't think they were capable of doing, but also able to bring them together. You are able to go break down a barrier. You're able to go talk to you know a principal or a superintendent or a school board. And you can also set these kids up for success. Um, we had a couple of great, uh, an administrator and uh, one of our general managers, both women, who uh, helped to have uh, Carthage, or not Carthage, uh, Gateway Technical College was thinking about getting into esports. Mm -hmm. And so they actually brought over some of their, we call them scholar gamers, to show the board, the, the technical college board, how to play Rocket League. And it was, Again, these these two women who helped to bring the kids there, but it was really the kids who were then set up for success to show off this game and like sit down with these board members, a lot of them 40s and 50s and even 60s so in their cool. 60s, and <laughs> teach them in a, in about 10, 15 minutes, teach them the basics of Rocket League and why and talk about why it was important for them. Mm. So this it's not just this. The the gamers are gonna to to be the ones who I guess drive the ship mm -hmm. but it's again thinking of the whole experience thinking beyond the games making sure that you have something for shout casters making sure that you know if there's one school that's doing something in your district or in a town nearby don't necessarily fall into the trap of having to copy them um, mm -hmm. they might have very different needs very different wants very different reasons for doing even even sports in my own school district in the racine unified school district i was working until uh june 30th um we had Two, two middle schools that were approaching me to talk about esports. One school, all they cared about was their attendance was horrible mm -hmm. and they needed to make sure that their attendance was good. So they wanted to really start engaging these kids who are not showing up to school. Mm -hmm. So think about that. That's going to be a very different population than the other school, which was the fine arts school that wanted to focus on getting kids in front of the camera and getting them performing. They were more interested in the broadcast side of things. They really, mm -hmm. they, they could have done nothing external but focused on let's do let's practice shout casting and make that our thing mm -hmm. okay so you know when we talk about including people when we talk about what this all can be th that's the beautiful thing about this is there's no definition as i have found in in since doing this now for almost 8 years there is no one way to do this that works that's the beauty part of this it, I love it's that. not like with math it's not like with reading. It's not like with social studies where there's one right answer. Well, unless you can really explain it well. This is this is what works for you and what is me. And it takes thought and it takes expertise and it takes it takes commitment. And again, this isn't just you roll it out, start on on you know two weeks earlier and and get it going. It's there has to be a lot of planning about where are your strategic goals. Look at your school or your school district strategic goals. If student engagement, especially people of color, children of color, is a problem in your school district, that's a goal right there that you're going to be building your esports program towards, right? Mm -hmm. It should be. That's the thing that's going to get you funded when the budget is being cut years down the road. And, and you're like, well, we've just got all these video games. But you can't speak to that problem that the district was having before when they gave you all that money before. You, you've got a problem. You've got to be able to speak to those things. You've got to build around those things. It may not be the esports, the pro style program that you've always wanted, right. but that's not the purpose of this. Not at the K twelve level. No, that's great, and I'm. This is this is a, um, a cur not a curveball question, but just something I'm curious about. So you provided valuable advice and considerations for those that are in the educational space. What can professional esports teams orgs do to support? The work that you're doing as an educator in the space like what what can the the pro scene do or even the industry at large to help advance scholastic um esports and gaming while i i know that there's a lot of people who say oh you know pro and the esports scene is so hyper toxic and you know there's toxic masculinity and bullying and look Anti-Defamation League did an amazing report on the state of online game communities. And yes, there are a lot of problems. I'm not going to say that there aren't. There's a lot of people who face abuse and, and harassment just because of the color of their skin or their gender or how their voice sounds or, for, or their age. 
I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had 12, I'm guessing 12 year olds tell me how terrible I am playing the game. And it, you can, I can laugh at it, but mm -hmm. it's also for some, that's enough of a turnoff to say like, why would I want to invest any time or anything into this space? That is true. But what I will say is that there's also, I think a good, the positive is I think that there's also a streak of social justice that exists in esports and a heck of a lot better than other sports. Uh, especially at the at the younger uh, levels of things, so I think that there's I what what I love to see is that there is that again that streak of social justiceness because this is a social justice issue. I believe that access to these games and this type of play, because digital play is is I think as important as physical play. Um, I believe that this now becomes something that if we're doing it right. All, we're talking now about digital redlining. We're talking about digital poverty. We're talking about uh, the issues in rural communities of access and how we need to better those things. And we need to make sure that that we are providing those places and spaces for kids and, and families to be able to connect into the bigger world. The pandemic put it on full display mm. how, how poverty and, and location can impact your place in the world and your education. So... I really feel that we need to make sure that in this in this space as we're moving forward that that we do think of this more along the lines of social justice and not just around play. I think that pro scene people need to be tuned to those things. They need to be tuned to like three years ago or two years ago when when Riot suddenly changed their community guidelines and the kids weren't able to play, you know, just use League of Legends as a title without paying play versus. I think the pro scene people should have been like, well, wait a second. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah. You know, what sense does that make? Where anybody can buy this, download this game free of charge. And now it's happening with Blizzard and nobody's speaking up. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a very few, there's very few of us who are speaking up about it, but it is out there and it is known. I really wish that what happens at the scholastic level impacts collegiate, it impacts amateurs, it impacts pros. You just don't see it right away. But I'll tell you, talking to the, some of the collegiate people after the changes that Riot made to their community guidelines around Re League of Legends in 2020, they found that all of a sudden, wait a second, we can't get college kids anymore to play League of Legends <laughs> because nobody's playing it. Mm. So again, we need to make sure that this is this whole ecosystem is it's like one giant organism. While we all think we are so different in so many different ways, we are all interconnected in some way. It may not be apparent to you right out the gate, but it is all connected. And, and, and again, if we are doing our job at the scholastic level of teaching the kids how to be better people in digital spaces, that should hopefully, we should start to see as we are engaging this, because for the longest time, teachers and educators did not engage in online spaces. We wanted nothing to do with social media. That was not our space. We did not want to step foot in any of those realms. Uh, we give kids access to YouTube. What are you crazy? <laughs> Let them use Wikipedia. What? Yeah. You think about that now and you're like, what are you talking about? Those are great <laughs> educational tools, but seriously, we need to, teachers need to be a part of this space. We need to start taking our head out of the sand and we need to start engaging with our kids in these spaces. Uh, one of the things I thought that was the biggest positive takeaway for us in the Racine Unified School District was our discord server. Um, not just for how it allowed us to have inter interpersonal communication, especially during the pandemic for a lot of our kids, that was necessary, but also for um, teaching kids about how to be good kids in online spaces. The memes channel. Oh, my God. So many, <laughs> yeah. People go like, you opened up a memes channel for high school kids? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and guess what? It was a great learning space because some of those <laughs> kids were able to put things out there, fail miserably and not have it cost them a job in the future. Mm -hmm. That's true. They learned like, oh my God, yes. Oh my, I, did, I thought that that religious joke that my family makes all the time or things that we do in my family or amongst my friends that we find are funny, 99% of the world doesn't find funny. Mm -hmm. and, and now I, I have a better perspective of the world than I have before. So, like I said, this is social justice. This is this yeah. is teaching kids. This is this is making sure that that ADL report that we see in the future doesn't continue to have us be in this downward spiral of online spaces being places of hate and bullying. And now, even worse, uh, my good friend Dr. Rachel Court, several podcast interviews with her, conversations on the Academy of Esports podcast. She's doing a lot of research now into 
um, how online spaces are used to groom kids uh, into hate organizations and 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 these are these are recruiting places and spaces so yeah. we we need to educators need to be in these spaces too mm-hmm. no Sorry, that's I, true i get off my church by my podium in my no no i am right there with you like pass the plate because i'm ready to put money in it because everything that you're saying it makes so much sense and you know i never really considered that like to your point there is a lot of conversation around these online spaces being terrible toxic places but the way that you flipped it with the memes channel, like they're, they're also places of lovely, you know, connection and community and growth. I never, ever really considered it as a place to learn about what is politically correct, what is not acceptable. Like that is such a brilliant, we need more of those spaces. And, and I'm, a, I'm a preaching to the choir here, but I'm gonna tell you why. And it's because we're, as an individual, you're just kind of like in your own like little pot of existence, right? Echo chamber. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You got the, oh, yeah. Your social network is absolutely your record. Who are you following exactly. that you don't like? Right. <laughs> exactly. And then it's like you unfollow them as soon as you're like, but if you're in an environment where it's like, hey, it's okay to be who you are. But if it's if it's coming off wrong, we're going to we're going to call you out on it lovingly. You know, we're not mm-hmm. going to like shut you down. But it, there's that space for grace. And I think that that's a conversation point that's missing, you know, even being a black woman in the industry, it's like, there's a lot that I've been put through, but grace and like, okay, this person, they really did not know, you know, or the, like me making a mistake. And it's like, well, I, I had no idea that this was an issue, you know, for this particular community. I am so sorry for minimizing it. Like there there's, there's learning there's grace and then there's community. And I think those, those three things are really important in, in helping make this industry more accessible, you know, cause nothing is going to turn around overnight. I, I have, I have made some great connections, people who I would not normally or necessarily have connected with through this space. Uh, I have to say, Carrie Linden, uh, the Chalk Muju has been one of the people I will point to and say, she carried me and i should say carried but educated me opened my eyes to a lot of of things uh ken shelton did exactly the same thing as well too not so much in the gamer sense but um yeah i i'll say that there's a lot of that james thank you so much for all of the insight and wisdom that you've provided to us on this podcast episode today i know i'm fired up like i was a teacher for like this long and <laughs> i was, <laughs> and I was like <laughs> Yeah, it is. For those of you who are listening, I'm making my hands about two feet apart. <laughs> Mine is definitely like fingers pinched together, like, boop, I was in and out. So, um, but one thing that does get me fired up is just the potential of, well, the impact that gaming can have in the education space. Um, I know it was a part of my education with Math Blasters. My parents, they always had us playing um, these, there was a game called, what was it called? biology and it was weird and had songs about like plant matter and using the bathroom it was just really crazy there yeah it was there was a we still know the words to that song and dad's like why you were like five it is like <laughs> and orly straw story which was definitely about artistic expression and and um organ trail of course i i that's a staple you know they rebooted it Oh, I've played it on my phone. Okay, good. I was like, I'm I'm pretty sure you knew that already, but <laughs> But children of the eighties who are listening to this or watching this, go on YouTube and find Oregon Trail the movie trailer. Wait, are you wait? Is oh it's, an, it's thing? yeah, go on YouTube, find Oregon Trail the movie trailer. <laughs> oh my god, get it's, out. It, and it's been on YouTube for like ten years, but it is hysterically funny every time I watch it. I have not seen that. I'm definitely going to go check that out. Absolutely. Um, and Zoom Beanies, which is a good problem solving oh game. You remember Zoom God. Beanies? Well, because I was a teacher at the time, I remember Zoom Beanies. <laughs> yes. I used to think that was such a weird game. And I started playing it again. I'm like, this game is still weird, but I still like it. Like... But yes, education and gaming. I mean, it's been the baseline of my life and I didn't even really realize it. So thank you for taking us a little bit deeper behind the scenes and what impact and potential impact gaming and and uh, education can have. For sure. 
one of my other favorite questions, other than the ones that I started with, if you could go back in time to when you decided to advocate for gaming and education, what advice would you give yourself? Yeah, well, again, it's, it, it goes to, are we talking about the esports side in 2014 or are we talking, I'm, I'm going to go back to the 1999 me. Okay. Because I, so stuck in their ways and then you get older and you're like going oh man i'm only 10 years away from retirement which when you're starting you're like oh i'm 33 years away from retirement you're all ready to try stuff new but really um i should have committed more to it because the opportunities of games and gameplay uh whether it was extended recess time or whether it was using t uh, mind mind tra we used a game called mind trap which was uh cards and it was like it was like you know they were those um Oh, what do they call those? They're like riddles, right? Mm -hmm. They were just cards of riddles, and I would just read them off in class, and we would just have, you know, competitions about it. Um, cool. But I wish I had committed more to games and gameplay. Uh, that start, SimCity was a good start, but I think that had I looked more at other titles and really thought about what it is that I am trying to teach. What is, what is, what are I, what are my supposed to be my goals this year? What do we want kids to be able to do and to learn and then take those games and try to build around that. I, I wish I had done that, that, th that would have made my life a whole lot different, but I'm not going to, I'm just going to say to that new teacher, you know, that 21 year old who's probably just starting here in a few weeks. Yeah. Don't be afraid to explore those things now because it, it the, the, this is this is a great way to not only engage yourself and get you thinking but get kids excited about school like i still can't figure out why nobody has come up with hey we're just going to call this the minecraft school like everybody's like this is a stem school like stop calling it a stem school. kids don't give a dang about stem they don't <laughs> but if you call if you call your school the minecraft elementary school oh i'll bet gosh. you kids are going to be beating down your door mm -hmm. But people are afraid to do it. I don't know why. They just are. Well, hopefully we'll see a Minecraft school soon. Because I know my nephews would beg to attend. <laughs> and then the thing is, is you're still in a digital space. You know, so mm -hmm. infinite programming. You know, it doesn't have to be tied to a brick and mortar. Yeah. And and, and again, it, it really doesn't. Um, I, I got to say that that virtual schools... We, we embraced, the game that we really embraced in the virtual program last year, last several years, has been Among Us. Mm. Uh, we really focused on that because we don't have, in a virtual space, we didn't have kids who were getting the practice of raising their hand and asking for permission to speak or talking to their class as much because we were so asynchronous, meaning the kids were working at their own pace and you know they could meet with their teachers one-on-one. -on -one. But really, when we talk, started talking about let's use Among Us as a way to promote persuasive speaking mm. or group speaking or taking mm -hmm. turns or how to define rules and, and, and making sure that we are following those rules. And it's not just the teacher who's setting up those rules. It's the kids who are helping to set those rules. That is that is what these games are. And then we're playing and then you're playing Among Us. And boy, are there are some kids who are some really just savage uh <laughs> absolutely just cutthroat among us players oh you're yeah. right i was not ready i was just like whoa wow i really thought you were i thought you were on the side you were out here just lying arcing people the whole time like yep. what? <laughs> and lying about it so yes. well the whole <laughs> time have me voting other people off like nah nah mm -hmm. i couldn't be oh man you can talk about a head trip um, but no, that's, that's a, among us that I didn't think about it, uh, from a persuasive speaking standpoint, but that's exactly it. Like now I know that one of my homework assignments is going to be like, Oh, what games have I played that could be used in an educational sense? You know, it's I've, a fun got exercise. A, I've got a, a podcast interview I did with a Dr. Tore Olson and he Ew. talked about using uh red dead redemption Two. Oh, Oh, that's an excellent game to teach about the American South at a collegiate level so okay so closing question sure. if you had to rattle off three games that have educational properties that are widely unconsidered what would they be fortnite 
uh, is the, the creative, the creative builder mode. Okay. So being able to build a world that uh, other kids can then go into and play and run around in. And it's kind of like building your own jungle gym, you know? Fair point. You, yeah. you just get to murk your friends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how you do it. Um, let's see. Other game. I, I really uh, love a game, a game like uh, the City Builders. Mm-hmm. Any city, just about any city builder has some really interesting um ways of working there's there's not just the sim city there's city skylines if you want to get really ridiculous around city planning um then there's also the very simple ones um oh there's a foundation which is a very simple city builder um i love city building games and again i think that there's a lot uh within those and then the one that uh i'm not going to say it's so much as an education i mean i can make it educational but to speak through, I think people think of Minecraft too narrowly. Um, I know that again, my good friend Ken Shelton and others worked on uh, the Good Trouble lessons that Microsoft has put out through Minecraft EDU, reflecting on the uh, civil rights era and introducing kids into some of the issues that are sometimes very difficult to understand, but putting them into a into again a place or a space that is intrinsically motivating for them. So again, look up Good Trouble Minecraft, and you okay. will find. I, I think Minecraft is a highly underthought of, underutilized, but I know that there's people doing great things within it to, as a platform, as a, as a learning and teaching platform. I'm not ready. I don't think Roblox personally is ready for prime time yet. Uh, frankly, I think that there's a lot of data security issues and privacy issues related to Roblox that really concern me. But Minecraft has done a really, the Microsoft folks have done a really good job of buying something and actually making it better like hmm. really making it better, especially from the EDU perspective. And that gives me hope that if the Activision Blizzard deal goes through, that we'll see more games and gameplay uh, being promoted by Microsoft as being more open to schools rather than uh, the current state of what's, like I said, happening with Overwatch. So Right. No, that's good. All right. I like that. Thank you for sharing. i um, going to check those out. Um, so, James, you know, Thank you so much for your time today. It's been a delight to talk to you. Um, even Essie got her two cents in every now and then. <laughs> you know, so All thank good. you for your patience in that regard. Um, for those that want to learn more about learn more about you or what you're up to at League Spot, how can they reach out? How can they get in touch? Uh, the best way is if you go to Twitter, just go to at Jim O'Hagan, at J-I-M-O-H-A-G-A-N. Uh, you can get me there. Or if you go to taoesports.com, that is the Academy of Esports. That I, The podcast is, uh, again, is you can look up for the Academy of Esports podcast. Go grab some of the early episodes. Like I said, I think everything is still relevant. Um, I am, as I've been transitioning into this new role, trying to figure out where the podcast fits in the new company and, and, uh, and trying to figure out what the next steps are going to be. It has not ended. It's just on hiatus until I can get my uh, my feet underneath me. So, oh, well, good good to know because I was like I would be like, hey James, where's the next episode? <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, thank you again for your time. Uh, for everybody who's out there listening, I know I got a lot out of this conversation. I hope you did too. And let us know what resonated with you um, when this drops. You know, wherever you're viewing it from. You know, we'd love to know what you found valuable, what you've taken and applied to your own respective organizations or places and what you want to see in future episodes. So stay kind, stay safe, be healthy out there, and we will see you next time. 